our lecture on the life of the Virgin Mary. Today we will discuss the birth of our Lord. But before we get to that, we return to the factual presentation of what is known about the life of the Virgin. Let's stop for a moment on some interesting points and stories which come to us from the Apocrypha. Even though Joseph accepted the assurance of the angel and married Mary, he was afraid that anybody noticing her as pregnant would accuse him of adultery, would accuse her of adultery, or of him defiling her. And even though he was willing to cover her up, he was afraid that a trial through the drinking of the water of conviction would censor both of them. And the trial by the drinking of the water of conviction is, is found in Numbers 5, 11 to 30. And this is what it says. If any man's wife went astray and acted unfaithfully against her husband, even though undetected, and the husband became suspicious and jealous, he could bring his wife to trial before the Sanhedrin and two witnesses who would corroborate the suspicions of the husband and made to drink the water of conviction. And this was pure water mixed with some dust from the floor of the tabernacle of witness. And if the woman, if the woman was guilty, her belly would swell and her thigh would fall off. And if not, nothing would happen to her. And if found guilty, the man was compelled to divorce her and disinherit her. So Joseph is portrayed as telling Mary, the crime of adultery will fall upon us for her committing it and him for concealing her. And the water of conviction will censor both of us. Here is the scenario. Joseph who is a member of the Sanhedrin, missed the last meeting of the body. When asked by a scribe by the name of Annas, who was sent to his house to find out why he had missed the meeting, Joseph responded that it was because he was too tired from work and the trip from the seashore where he was building a house. Then Annas noticed that Mary was pregnant. So he left in a hurry and reported it to the priest with these words. Joseph has defiled the virgin he received from the temple of the Lord. He had married secretly and did not report it to the sons of Israel. Then the priest, Abiathar, had Joseph arrested and brought to the temple with Mary. The priest then said to Mary, Why did you do this? Why did you stoop so low and forget the Lord your God? Mary wept bitterly and said, As the Lord my God lives, I stand pure before him and declare that I have known no one, and I have known no man. The priest then turned to Joseph and said, why did you seduce such a great and glorious virgin who was fed like a dove in the temple by the angels of our Lord, our God? She never desired to have anything to do with the man because she had been dedicated to God. Had you not done this, she would have preserved her virginity. But Joseph vowed and swore up and down that he had nothing to do with this, and he had never touched her, saying, As the Lord lives, I am innocent concerning her and her virginity. So the priest was forced to give them both to drink the water of 
addiction or testing, even though this is highly unusual since the law states, this is the law in cases of jealousy, why not wife, or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man as he is jealous of his wife, then he shall set the wife, the woman, before the Lord, and the priest shall execute, execute upon her all of this, the law. Or if the husband should suppose that adultery had taken place, the man shall be free from the iniquity, but the woman shall bear the iniquity. And this is found in Numbers chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. That is, the man was not subject to this law. And when this water had no effect on neither Joseph or Mary, the priest said, If the Lord God did not reveal your sin to us, neither will I judge you. And Joseph took Mary and went to his house, rejoicing and glorifying the God of Israel. And why do you suppose the Apocrypha, Apocrypha would create such a story? They created this story to convince the Jews the absolute truth of this great mystery of the Messiah. Which now brings us to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are indeed very familiar with the gospel story of the birth of our Lord. Now let us look how the Apocrypha embellished this story. As Joseph was preparing to depart from Nazareth, he was wondering how he was going to enroll Mary, the young maiden. Should he enroll her as his wife? He would feel ashamed because of the great difference in age. He being 80 and she being around the age of 13 to 16. Should he enroll her as his daughter, he would cause eyebrows to be raised because all the people knew that she was not his daughter. So he said to himself, when the time of the Lord's appointment shall come, let him do as it seems best for him. Then he saddled the donkey and put Mary upon it, and one of his sons led it, and he and his sons and the others followed. And travel was slow for, for both man and animal back then. The average, average travel for people was about 15 miles per day, while the donkey caravans tried to make 20 miles per day. Within three miles of Bethlehem, they rested at a well. And Joseph turned, and he saw Mary, and she looked sad. And he thought that maybe she was in pain because of her pregnancy. But then he turned around again, and he saw her pain turn to happiness. So he asked her, Mary, how is it that sometimes you're sad and then your face is bright again? And she replied, I see two people before me. One is sad and mourning, and the other is glad and rejoicing. And that is, one is rejoicing in the birth of the Messiah, and the other is refusing to accept him. And the little town of Bethlehem was crowded with all the people who had come from all of the outlying districts to register for the tax. And there was no place for them to settle. And suddenly Mary says to Joseph, Take me off the donkey because I am going to have a child. And where shall I take you? Joseph asked. 
I have no idea, Mary answered. But please, take me off the animal. So Joseph took her off the animal and found the shepherd's cave and took her there. Then leaving her with his sons, he went out to find a midwife to help deliver the child. The time was now about sunset. Walking about throughout the city of Bethlehem, he found a woman coming down from the hill country whose name, excuse me, who said to Joseph, where are you going? And he answered, I am looking for a Hebrew midwife. And she gestured that she was one and said to him, are you an Israelite? And he replied, yes, I am. And the midwife, whose name was Zilomi, continued, Who is going to deliver in the cave? A woman betrothed to me, replied Joseph. She's not your wife? the woman asked. And Joseph said, It is Mary, who has been reared in the temple of the law. By lot I have obtained her as my wife. But yet, she is not my wife yet, but she is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the midwife then said, Is it really true? And Joseph answered, Come and see. And Zalomi went with him, and they stood in the cave together. And behold, a luminous light overshadowed the cave, which made Zalomi remark, my soul has been magnified in this day because my eyes have seen the strange things because salvation is brought before all of Israel. Then a cloud disappeared and a great light shone in the cave that blinded all their eyes and little by little the light decreased. Then they beheld the infant at the breast of the virgin. Are you the mother of the child? The midwife asked. And when the virgin nodded, Zalomi said, You are not at all like the daughters of Eve. And the virgin Mary said, Just as my son has no equal among the children, so his mother has no equal among the women. And the midwife then went out of the cave and met Salome, another midwife, and said to her, Salome, I have a strange sight to relate to you. A virgin has given birth, a thing which nature does not admit. Salome, who was Mary's mother's sister's daughter, thus her first cousin, did not believe that this had taken place, or it was possible for a virgin to give birth. So she sought proof. So she went into the cave and decided to examine Mary with her finger. Whereupon her finger withered, and she cried and repented, and asked for forgiveness for her unbelief. And she took the baby into her arms, and at once her finger was healed. Blessed Jerome writes that on the precise moment of the birth, no midwife assisted at his birth. Mary, with her own hands, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, herself both mother and midwife. St. Clement of Alexandria, of Alexandria expressed ideas not prominent as yet among the fathers. For certain people says that Mary examined by the midwife after she had given birth was found to be still a virgin. And the title of ever virgin, Hypothenos, was first used by St. Peter of Alexandria in 311 A.D and was used by St. Athanasios, who was one of the first to argue the perpetual virginity of Mary. Apart 
from assisting the mother. The midwife's duties include washing the baby, rubbing it with salt, water, and oil, and then unwrapping it in swaddling bands. The procedure of applying salt was not only used as a disinfectant, but the Jews but the Jews at that time believed that salt rubbed over the skin would harden it. Also, they believed that the soft bones would grow straight, would grow straight and firm if they were bound tightly. So the infant would be wrapped in these bands for seven days. Then the process, process was continued until the child was 40 days old. These bands were four to five inches in width and five to six yards long. Visiting iconographers have often presented the scene of the bathing of Christ's child by two women, identified by the Apocrypha as Salome and Salome. Not only did the birth of Christ not violate the virginity of the blessed Theotokos, but the birth came about without any pain. Both of these articles of faith for the true, true Christian believer, writes Jacques, um, Jacques Doucet, a French bishop. He came out as a shot of light and as a ray of the sun. His mother was astonished seeing him appear so suddenly. The delivery was free of cries and pains and anxieties. Wondrously conceived, he was born even more wondrously. The Holy Fathers considered his birth even more astonishing than his conception by a virgin. Had not Isaiah prophesied as much? Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. The theological term Theotokos is one of the most fundamental of Christian piety. St. John of Damascus writes, Behold that God was born of her, not implying that divinity of the word received from her, the beginning of his being, but meaning that God the word himself, who was begotten of the Father, timelessly before of the ages, was, both, was with the Father and the Spirit, without beginning and through eternity, took upon his abode in these last days, for the sake of our salvation, in the virgin womb, and was without change made flesh and born of her. For the Holy Virgin did conceive and did not bear mere man, but bear a true God. Not only God, but God incarnate, do not, who did not bring down a body from heaven, nor simply pass through the virgin as a channel, by received from her flesh of like essence to our own and subsist, subsisting in himself. For if a body had not come down from heaven and had not partaken of our nature, what would have been the use of his becoming man? For the purpose of God, the word becoming man was that very same nature which has sinned and fallen and been corrupted to triumph over the deceiving tyrant and so be freed upon corruption. Hence, it is with justice and truth that we call the Holy Mary the Mother of God. For this name, the Apocos embraces the whole mystery of the dispensation. And St. John continues saying, We never say that the Holy Virgin is the mother of Christ. 
Christotokos. Because this appellation came about in order to do away with the title of the Mother of God, Theotokos. To bring dishonor on the Mother of God, who alone is in true, truth worthy of honor above all creation. And the term Theotokos was rejected by the heretic Nestorius. The Nestori um, Nestorius was a, a Syrian theologian and patriarch of Constantinople from 428 to 431, who thus split the two natures of Christ and referred to his mother as Christotokos, the one who bore Christ the man, not Theotokos, the one who bore Christ the God. Friend and counsel of Nestorius is in his early years was the presbyter Anastasios, who in one of his sermons said, no one should be called Mary the Theotokos, because Mary was a human being, and it is impossible for God to be born of a human. This shocked both clergy and laity, who were always taught to speak of Christ as God, and never to split his divinity from his humanity. Nestorius, however, instead rebuking his favor, Anastasius approved his sermon, and he himself rejected the term Theotokos. The true faith was defended against the heresy of Nestorius by Cyril of Alexandria, who lived from 376 to 444, who made the motto of his Christological battles the fact that the Virgin is Theotokos, and he became the heart and soul of the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431, which restored the dogma of the Theotokos forever with these words, We confess, therefore, our Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God, consubstantial with the Father in divinity, consubstantial with us in humanity, because in Him, with, you, with union of the two natures, came about. Hence, we confess one Christ, one Son, and one Lord. And in accordance with the true meaning of this unconfused union, we confess the Holy Virgin as a Theotokos, because God the Word was incarnated and became man through her. And through this conception united with himself the temple that came from her. During the birth of our Lord, and right after the birth of our Lord, we had the visitation of the shepherds and the animals in the cave. And the shepherds were watching their flock <coughs> in a very far place, consecrated by tradition as where the Messiah would first be revealed. St. Cosmas, the poet, writes that the shepherds abiding in the field received a vision of light that filled them with terror. For the glory of the Lord shone around them, and an angel cried aloud, singing praises for Christ is born. And then the angel joined by many others. Thus we see the nativity icons, angels performing a twofold service. They glorify God and they bring good tidings to men. St. Ephraim puts the following words into the mouths of the shepherds. The shepherds came there and worshipped him with their staffs. They saluted him with peace, prophesying, saying, Peace, O Prince of the Shepherds, the Rod of Moses. Praise your Rod, O Shepherds of all. 
from the 6th century in which the first icon of nativity is reputed to have been painted until the 12th. From no icon of nativity are there missing two <clears throat> are, are there missing two animals, the ox and the donkey from the cave. In one of the oldest icons, the ox and the donkey are pictured, kneeling as if giving thanks to God. Were these the two animals actually in the cave on the historic night? Some say yes, and others say no. However, it appears that the presence of the animals is merely symbolic based on the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 3. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master. But Israel does not know my people. And my people do not understand. Both the prophecy and the allegory reveal a divine lament. To the shame of a rational man, the first to the great divine appearance was the irrational nature. And if we study the history of the people, we'll find the practice of circum circumcision not only among the Jews, but the Arabs, the Egyptians, the Aztecs, as well. However, the difference in this practice from all the other people was that of the Jews is quite distinct. Because while all the others circumcised themselves for reasons of health, or for coming of age, for which a certain age is always fixed, the Jews practiced it out of strict religious requirement shortly after their life begins. Mohammed was circumcised because the custom was prevalent in Arabia, and his followers kept up his example. There is no compulsory ordinance in the Quran, however, the patriarch Abraham ordered by God to do it with terrible consequences on his heirs if they failed to practice this. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh for your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He that is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout the generations, whether born in your house or brought within or, or bought with your money from any foreigner, so shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, and he has broken the covenant. And this we read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 through 14. The great religious significance which circumcision carries for the Jew can be seen on the one hand from the story of Zipporah, whose sons were pursued by the angel to be put to death because he was uncircumcised until the child was circumcised and he escaped all the danger. And from the habit of the Isra 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 Israelites to refer to all the nations outside of the covenant with the contemptuous title of uncircumcised. And this is what we find in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19 through 20, upon the, day of, upon, the, upon the death of Saul and Jonathan, your glory, O Israel, is slain in your high places. How are the mighty to fall? Tell it not to God. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, and let the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. 
The mystical meaning of the circumcision of the Jews was that from the moment that the child was born, he became a sealed property of God. And just as the natives of Africa or Australia designed with a needle on their skins to tattoo a particular animal, which is the emblem of their tribe, so that you will never forget to whom they belong. Likewise, the Jews did it also through circumcision, this primitive and, undevelop and underdeveloped time which distinguish the sign and covenant between them and God. But it had another meaning as well. Since according to the Jewish, Jewish ideology, blood is a symbol of life and existence. For the life of the flesh is in blood. This we read in Leviticus 17, verse 11. There can be no circumcision Without the shedding of blood. This means that the circumcised, the circumcised bleeds so that he can enter into the higher life of God. However, all these teachings were understood by a very few and long before the divine incarnation of our Lord and Savior. The ordinance of circumcision had become an idle, idle form kept only for those having lost any higher need. In name, God would call, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. In vain did God proclaim to the prophets that not only the uncircumcised in the flesh but the uncircumcised in the heart shall never enter in my sanctuary. This ordinance which served Judaism in its early age was unable to keep in step with the demands of the Christian's birth. Thus the Lord is appearing midway between the two eras, applied circumcision to himself in his infant age, as a fitting sign for infants, for it replaced it when he grew up with the much nobler act of baptism. Another author observes that if Jesus was not circumcised, none of the Jews would pay any attention to his teaching but would reject him as a foreigner and not from the seed of Abraham. It was love to the Apostle Paul to show with a vivid phrase that circumcision was derived all its value from keeping of the divine law. And if it did not have any meaning at all, and if the uncircumcision keep, keeps its kept the law, it shall be considered as circumcision it shall come under its blessing. Circumcision indeed is a, is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So our Lord's circumcision is to be regarded as part of the law. And those who are physically uncircumcised must keep the law, both condemn you who have the whip, who have the written law and the code. For he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and literal. His praise is not for men, but for God. Wrote St. Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 25 to 29. And 
And when, at the age of 99, the first patriarch of the Jews was circumcised, but it was only then that he received the ordinance of circumcision. He also assumed the new name of Abraham because he was destined to become the father of many nations. Likewise, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. This we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, or chapter 2, verse 21. Because so had the angel warned Mary when he brought her the good news. He reassured Joseph when he was doubting Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is conceived from the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. The complete form of the name is Joshua, which means, which later was short to Joshua, which finally to Joshua, which in the New Testament times, and in Helena, which was Hellenized, the name Jesus, Jesus. Some of the fathers, such as Clement of Alexandria and Cyril of Jerusalem and Epiphanius of Cyprus, sought a liberation of the name and the verb of to mean to heal. But later, it was universally accepted that the name is of Hebrew origin from the divine name of Yash, Yahweh or, jo, or Joshua and the verb to be happy or impregnable and the verb which means to help or to free or to save. Thus the, thus the, the, the name Yahweh is salvation or saves or will save. And the name Jesus is found in several parts of the Old Testament and was particularly popular in the first century. And this will conclude today's lecture painting the birth of our Lord. Thank <laughs> you.